one thing when God sent his only begotten son into this world, um, he had a certain agenda. And God still has an agenda. And this agenda hasn't changed. The political agendas have changed. The world scene has changed. Many different things have changed in the world. But this hasn't changed. God's agenda. And God had an agenda because God's outside of time when he sent his son into this world. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, it tells us that the God of our fathers, that's, uh, that's Paul speaking, who's a Jew, speaking of the fathers of the Jews, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, raised up Jesus, whom you murdered. And you know, it's like Paul didn't, um, I, I, think, I think it was Paul spoke this, I'm not sure if this was Stephen, it might have been Stephen, but he didn't mix his words. He didn't say you condemned him unjustly. He said you murdered him. Uh, you, you know, Stephen. Was there, Stephen. Stephen, yeah. And they were just about to murder Stephen. So he was he was hitting it straight, like getting straight to the point. He wasn't playing with some kind of woolly words and you know he was guilty or he was wrongly convicted. No, you murdered him. By hanging him on a tree. And the Jews used to say, Cursed is everyone who's hung <coughs> on a tree. And the scripture says he became a curse. Where are we going to? 31. Him is speaking of Christ. God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and saviour. And this is just what I want to focus on this morning. To give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. But in verse 31, what stuck, stuck out to me was this, to give repentance. Because we, we often talk, uh, talk about God forgiving us. You know, we, we, we just thank the Lord, we, we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And what a Christian is, um, there's a guy I, I hadn't met before in a, there's a Christian charity shop in Turles, and, um, and I just got talking to him, and he just said to me, he was, he was a Christian, he said, Christians aren't perfect, he said, but Christians are forgiven. And a lot of the time as Christians, we, we're, we're aware of that. Sometimes we do struggle with stuff, but we're aware of it. But what we're not so maybe mindful of is that God gives us repentance. It's not something you decided I'm going to say sorry for my sins now and everything's going to be okay with God. That's actually not how it works. Believe it or not. God has to grant you repentance. There's a, a prayer that um, Paul, or that, yeah, because Paul preached this. I think it's in a 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 to 26. Sorry, that's, yeah. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance. And you see, God grants repentance. It's a kind of a strange thing because we think when we repent of our sins, you know, then everything's okay with God. But that's not quite the case. There's a repentance that God grants. It's in his power to grant it. And Paul is preaching or, or exhorting Timothy here that maybe God, not to fight with people who disagree with you or argue with them, but to gently correct them. And maybe God will grant them repentance. You know, because Paul obviously like, knew the heart of God, that God's... God wants all men to be saved. Well, you would probably expect that God would grant repentance to everybody, but he doesn't. Because there are kind of like, um, there, are, there are bases of it. In Luke chapter 24, verse 47, and this was the commission to the um, early church fathers to go and preach this gospel, and that repentance... And remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And notice that Jesus is instructing them to preach both repentance and forgiveness of sins. They're not going out just to 
preach forgiveness of sins, but they're going out to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. And I just found this quite interesting because I always thought, like in my mind, you know, repentance is something that we initiate. You know, we feel guilty about something, and then we, you know, cop on as they say and say to God, I'm sorry. But then, as I looked at this, I began to realize, no, actually, true repentance is something God initiates. It's not something that you're introspectively um, trying to, you know, come to terms with something in your life. But it's something God initiates. That's why God sent the Holy Spirit, because he said the Holy Spirit will convict. That's God. And it's not till the Holy Spirit convicts your heart that you can genuinely repent. Anything else is wishful thinking. It's a spiritual thing. It's God's Spirit bringing conviction and then you can respond. But you can't respond without the conviction. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38 and Peter said to them these were um, a bunch of people who had witnessed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and uh, there were Jews who were around when Jesus had preached and Peter said to them repent let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of sins and you shall receive gift of the Holy Spirit. The repentance that God grants precedes faith and precedes the receiving of the Holy Spirit. You do not receive the Holy Spirit and you do not receive the faith to receive the Holy Spirit until you experience genuine conviction by the Spirit of God of sin. I can actually remember the specific sin that the Holy Spirit convicted me of when I was watching TV and I called him his name. I remember the exact, exact sin, exact moment, and that's when I just, you know, the, the, the turn went inside and I called him the Lord. I remember, precise, it was like pinpoint. And God is very precise. And sometimes we, in ourselves, in our relationship with God, we try to preempt things. You know, we, we maybe, I don't know, maybe from, I had a religious upbringing, so you, know, you scrutinize yourself a lot and, you know, checking yourself about certain things, but it's no good really, unless God comes on the scene and grants you something genuine. In Acts chapter 10, verse 43, Paul said, Acts chapter 10, 43. Sorry, my writing is bad. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him has received forgiveness of sins. That's Acts 10, verse 43. Of him, Jesus Christ, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, the name of Jesus, everyone who believes in him has received forgiveness of sin. You know, the fact that you believe that your conversion, the f just the fact that you believe that Jesus, Son of God, rose from the dead, is an evidence to you that you've been forgiven. The faith comes after the forgiveness. It, 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 maybe it all happens like so close together, but the conviction comes first, the repentance comes second, you know? The faith comes third, and then comes the gift of the Holy Spirit. God has a certain way of, you know, a certain order to what He does, but if you're here this morning and you believe in Him, Yeshua, Adonai, our Messiah, our Lord and Saviour, then you have been forgiven for your past sin. Our pledge. In, let's just make a point, there's no true repentance without faith in Christ. 
That's what that scripture is saying. You know, if there's no genuine faith in Christ, there's never a true repentance from anybody. It's um, a temporal thing. You know, I won't do it again. And many people have raised kids and told them off not to do it. I won't do it again. Two weeks later, they're back again. I won't do it again. I promise I'll do it never, ever, ever again. Ever, ever again. <clears throat> and six months later, you know, because we're human. You know, we, we may serve, say at certain times we don't want to do certain things, but we're limited by our own human failings. In Acts 13, verse 38, it says, Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and through him, I have a different verse that I'm reading here, actually, so, forgiveness of sins, <coughs> I'll just read it the way I've written it down here. Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things. Is that one, is that verse? Continue with that one or something. Should it be preached to you, forgiveness of sins? The next part. Sorry. But it's a different version I hear, have here. It's proclaimed to you, and through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things. You need to believe this, really, if you believe in Jesus. You really need to believe that the scriptures, what the scripture says, which is true, that you are freed from all things, the scripture says, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. And then you use it differently uh, here. Thanks, John Mark. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things. <coughs> this other translation said, freed from all things from which you could not be justified or freed by the law of Moses. All things. That's all the consequences of sin and the curses that are specified in the Old Testament for those who break Old Testament covenant. And the sicknesses and disease that sometimes accompany sin. All things, all things that the law stated would take place if you broke the law in certain ways or whatever, you have been free from the law. So just to have clear in your mind, you are not under law, the scripture says, but you are under grace. You have been freed from the power of the law. That doesn't mean that the law has no relevance, because the law teaches us what sin is. And the scripture says that all sin is transgression of the law. So when we ever do a take a check on the moral law, and we're breaching the moral law, even if we don't feel we're sinning, we're sinning. It's there as, as a, a schoolmaster, the scriptures describe a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. Um, in the Greek word for um, repentance, they have a word most commonly used called metanoia. And it means a transformative change of heart, especially a spiritual conversion. Something happens in your heart. That's where conversion takes place. That's where true repentance takes place. Repentance is not of the mind. The mind is like a processor. But repentance takes place in the heart. True repentance takes place in the heart. Another word they use is metamelonia in the Greek, which are the two words used for repentance in the New Testament. It means to have a feeling of care, concern, or regret, which is akin to remorse. I don't know, I mean, like, if we're being real with ourselves and we sit around and I know sometimes when I'm alone, sometimes I remember things that I regret, you know? It's like, uh, I know you're not supposed to, we're supposed to be kind in maybe this, but sometimes I just wish I could turn back the clock. And that's actually a sign of repentance. That's a sign that you're actually sorry for something in and of itself. But it's, a, it's a, how do I put it to you? I'll just leave it at that. In the, in the um, Hebrew, the idea of, they use this word called nakan for repentance, and it means to let, to lament, to grieve, to sigh, breathe strongly, and be sorry. 
You know, oh, I wish I never did that. We don't often like to say that about things, mistakes we've made in life or sins we've committed. The word to use is sh shub. And this word means a radical change of mind towards sin. It means a turning around or a turning away. Actually, the Hebrews have a word called keshuva, which they, it, it's more seldom used word for repentance. And what that means is turn back. It's simply turning back to God in a way. It's repenting, you're turning back to God. Because actually what, what sin is really, it's a sign that you have uh, disenfranchised yourself with God. That you've broken fellowship with Him. You know, that you're not really walking in a, in a bonded relationship with Him. Um, repentance, here's one definition I like, is the change that takes place in one's life as a result of the Holy Spirit's work, and that's really important. It's not a willful thing. It's not so I will never do that again. It's not that. It's a result of the Holy Spirit's work to illumine one's consciousness to the state of sin in the presence of a holy God. So it's the Holy Spirit illuminating your conscience. <coughs> As he brings light into your conscience. I remember um, there, were, there were some attitudes I had that were ingrained in me because I had them since I was so young. And I, I'd become a Christian and I worked through some things with a pastor and prayed and did all the things he wanted me to do and confess and this, that, the other. But it was about 13 years later, I had a dream. And in the dream, God brought up these two attitudes in my heart. And I ended up at a conference about a month later in the UK. I met a guy who I'd seen in the dream and spoke to him about the dream by way of repentance. And those issues were never an issue anymore. But they'd become so ingrained in me, these attitudes, that I did not know they were there. As a matter of fact, I would justify them, you know, in some way, because I couldn't differentiate within myself the existence of these realm. This, it was so deep, but the Holy Spirit illuminated and brought them up. And after that, that was the end of the matter. That's why the scripture says the path of the righteous is like the first light of dawn shining brighter and brighter until the full light of day. We, according to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, we're granted a repentance from something called dead works. Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Just hold it there before you move on. Repentance from dead works. You know, I was just thinking about and the obvious thing with dead works is sin. Obviously you repent from sin. But actually, and I was re just reading some things around this, and a lot of dead works are like this. <clears throat> you could read the Bible every day. That could be a completely dead work. You can go to church every day. That could be a completely dead work. You can uh, pay lip service to God with your prayers and your prayer books and things. That can be a completely dead work. You know, most of the Christian done, people who are in church today are dead. And they are bringing out a dead book. And they're reading from a dead book. And somehow they think they're offering some kind of service to God. They're not. So, you know, we grow up in traditions, and that's the danger with tradition. When you, when the spirit is gone, and you, you, maybe down to generations, you're left with a whole lot of people following a tradition that maybe was real for their fathers. And so that can be a dead work. A lot of service we can be dead works. Actually, very often being a Christian and having a relationship with God, you can do the right thing with the right motive. Without having the Spirit of God, you can actually do the right thing with the wrong one. I remember seeing a, a picture one time of a, a bank and they had some big charity thing and they had a big, big check for some big charity. They're going to give this money to, you know, some big charity. And, but they were receiving their applause. It was a promo. It was like that. Aren't we wonderful? You know? We give away two million, whatever they give away. The motive have been wrong. Jesus said, you know, you're going to give your you know, your acts of mercy and kindness, do them in secret. So that no one's going to be saying, wow, isn't he such a generous man? Isn't he such a, a wonderful person? You know? 
oh, he's such an upright man and whatever. But God knows these things. Blessed are the pure in heart. They're going to see God. And then that verse goes on and says, um, verses, sorry, did you put it right down? Of the doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of the hands of resurrection dead and of eternal judgment. <coughs> and this we will do if God permits. For it's impossible for those, and this is really important to get this, because I assume all of us here are believers. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, that's speaking of the Holy Spirit and the illumination by the power of God, and having become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God, which we taste regularly, and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open chain. Now there's a lot of debate right now in the, I suppose it's gone on for centuries really, about how can we be perfect, as the scripture says, you know, that we're the spirits of righteous men made perfect. And yet there's a scripture here that is alerting us to the possibility of falling away. And actually, even stronger than that, that if we do fall away, it is so serious that you can't be wooed back to repentance. You see, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, that you can't be wooed back to repentance. And there's arguments about what actually falling away means. You know, is it someone like having a serious backside? Is it someone rejecting the Lord completely out of their lives? Is it someone that's... Um, how would, I, how would I put it to you? Who stops going to church? Is it someone who... There's a lot of kind of arguments and debate about what actually falling away. But the scripture says that in the last days, there would be a great falling away. A great, great falling away from God. Because of the persecutions that would come during the tribulation. A great falling away from God. People would say, you know, where's God now? Or whatever. And so we have to be just mindful of that. That when God grants us repentance unto faith, that is a that is an incredible thing. Absolutely incredible thing. Until Christ came, it didn't exist. It is an incredible thing that God, who made the universe, has mercy on you. And we can't take his mercy lightly. We can't just treat him as some kind of woolly guy up in the sky who just decides to smile down on me. He'll always smile at me no matter what. It's, it's, it's not really the heart of God. God is merciful and just. And God is holy. And that's just something to be, mind, to be mindful of. But not to maybe, you know, take, take, don't feel condemned or something. But it's just something to be mind, mindful of. Um, it's God's will that all come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. You know, people sometimes say, oh, he's a chosen one. Or oh, you're a special one. Or you belong to God, or you're one of those. But actually, it's God's will, scripturally. The Lord is not slack concerning his part, promise, the sub count slack, slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Actually, I believe one of the reasons God holds back on the judgments that are to come um, in the book of Revelations is precisely for that reason that God is trying to get in as many into his kingdom. As he possibly can. And actually when his judgments come. And particularly in, the, in, 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 in Revelation. When the earth is basically torn asunder. The purpose of it. Is for men to come to repentance. You see there's kind of two ways sometimes. It's like the, you know, the carrot and stick approach. Uh, the kindness of God. The carrot approach. Leading us to repentance. Because of his goodness. And then for, for, you know, for those who are. Deeply rebellious, then comes the stick approach. But it doesn't appear to um, appear to work if, if you read on the scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11, it says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So there's a, there's, there's a sorrow that comes from God. I, I, I'd maybe describe it like this. Um, I remember I was teasing Joy one time when she was younger. I would do it kind of, and she said, you're hurting me. 
And, and I could see it upset her. And I felt really bad. Because I hadn't <coughs> consciously, deliberately, and I felt sorry about it. And I think that's the way with God, when we feel sorry that we might have upset God or that we might have hurt him in some way. That's why the Bible says, you know, do not grieve the spirit. Why would the scripture say that the only unforgivable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? There's sensitivity involved in a relationship with God. But the Holy Spirit has feelings and he lives within us. God himself has feelings. That's why he reacts the way he does towards mankind at different times. Pulls back and blesses. God, God is a God who feels things. And however, it's hard to comprehend it how we can feel on an individual level, knowing every word we speak, every thought we think, and then at a corporate level, you know, national level, and then a corporate level in the world. But God does. He feels certain things. And he responds in certain ways based on his feelings. But the scripture says he's long-suffering. Matter of fact, he's so long-suffering, he's been allowing the 2,000 years since the time of Jesus to pass so that he could get us into his kingdom. Because he knew somewhere down the line, there are some more, there's some more, there's some more. And there's some incredible, incredible conversions taking place. I just, I just like listening to personal conversion stories. But I mean just incredible stuff. And God's will is that everybody come to repentance. But I think part of the problem in God not granting people that kind of repentance is the stubbornness of their own hearts. They've hardened their hearts so much that they can't even feel, if you like, um, they can't feel anymore. An example of uh, repentance that produced worldly sorrow was in Matthew 25, or Matthew 27, 3 to 5. You don't have to open it. That's Judas after he betrayed Jesus. He threw the money back at the guys and he said, I've betrayed him, this is blood. But he went away and hung himself. Because that brings death. There's a kind of a sorrow, you know, it's a regret afterwards that just brings death. It's not a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow that produces something of a change, if you like. But that just produces regret. And Romans chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, <clears throat> tells us it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? That's, that's a strange thing. It's, it's someone continues to be kind to you, even when you're throwing the sweets back in his face all the time, but he continues to show that kindness and long-suffering because he loves you. And so it's that goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's almost like in the end you feel like, how would I, I don't know how to put it to, in a way that might, but it's almost like, if, I don't know, but if someone's really good to you, overwhelmingly good to you, even when you're being very bad to them, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, or have you ever been really bad to someone who continues to be good to you all the time? It's, it's like, it does affect you, you know, it does eventually affect the person and sort of cause that person, I believe, to think differently. And that's actually part of really what repentance is. It's a, it's a, change, of, a change of mind. Um, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. And in Romans 4, Romans 5, but in accordance with your hardness, this is, um, Paul is rebuking uh, Romans at this point. And your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And that word there, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart. That word is a, a Latin word and penitent means to have remorse. <coughs> Or have it. Penitent simply means to regret, and impenitent means not to regret. And unfortunately, um, when your heart becomes severely hardened, you will have no regret for anything. That's why you can see in times of war, you know, going on for years, the most cruel and vile acts taking place because a person. You know, maybe who's perpetrated such things, so hearts are so hard to be unfeeling anymore. 
so they don't even regret what they're doing. They don't regret it anymore because their heart can't feel even, you know, the human level of regret at doing something that's, um, you know, that's, that's, that's evil and wicked and wrong. And it's, it's when man falls into that degenerative state where his heart is so hard and can't feel anymore. He simply can't. can't even feel his own, his own feeling, natural feelings, if you like, in how some of my, my you know, be, should behave, if you like. Um, but the, he's speaking there to unbelievers. Um, it, an, an example of it, where Jesus really got in the face of some people, is in Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32. And John has to find this here. But this is an example of the chief priests and the elders. They were challenging Jesus. You know, they kept on challenging him about who he is, who's, who's he to be telling anybody, who's he to say he forgives sins, and so on and so forth. So Jesus called them out, and, and Jesus very often called out the parables, or called out the Pharisees using a parable. Did you get it now? Uh, 21 verse 28 to 32. And here Jesus calls them out with this parable. He says, but what do you think? So he gets them to think. He doesn't point the finger directly. But he gets them to weigh it up for themselves. So he's talking now to the elders and the, and, and the priests. And he says, a man has two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he regretted and went. Did you ever say you won't do something and do it then? <laughs> Half an hour later, it's such a common thing. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Many people have promised you to do something and never did it. And then he says, which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him the first. Jesus said this to them. Assuredly I say to you, the tax collectors and the harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness. And you did not believe him. Here's John sent by God preaching the gospel. And the elders and the and the priests did not believe John. But the tax collectors and the harlots believed him. And when you saw it, in other words, when they then saw that the tax collectors and the harlots were going to John and being baptized, and when you saw it, you did not afterwards relent and believe. In other words, you didn't change your mind like you could have done and believed. And Jesus, Jesus basically called them out on it because he wanted to show up there hypocrisy. That um, baptism that Jesus was referring to is a baptism of repentance. I don't want to, you don't have to take it up, but it's in John the Baptist, Matthew 3, 8, 3, 11, Luke 3, 3 and 3, 8, Acts 13, 24, Acts 19, 4. That's speaking of the baptism which John performed, which is a baptism of repentance. Another thing about true repentance, Acts chapter 11, verse 18 tells us, that true repentance leads to life. When they heard these things, they became silent and glorified God, saying, Now, this is what the first Gentile conversion is. We're all Gentiles here, so. Then God, that, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. True repentance leads to life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. You know, true repentance has a very positive outcome. It's 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 a, it's it's a, just a marvel, really, because it has a power to change you temporally and eternally, and that's what God desires for all men. Jesus did comment about repentance um, not being for the righteous or for sinners in Matthew nine thirteen. Mark 2.17 and Luke 5.32. Jesus was basically having a go again at the elders, the priests, chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, because they considered themselves to be righteous, because they had a self-righteousness. Anyone know anybody who has a self-righteousness, which is not of God? And he called them out for that, because that's hypocritical. David had sinned with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, and then he sent Uriah to the front line 
the battle knowing well that, full well that he'd be killed. So he, he, he was now guilty of both adultery and murder. And he said, he got, after Nathan came as a prophet and gave him the prophecy, and this was his response. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put, your, uh, put away your sin. You shall not die. And that's verse 13 and verse 16. He says, David therefore pleaded with God for his child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. One of the real signs of the Old Testament repentance was fasting. And particularly, uh, it, when, in some instances, they put on sackcloth. It was like, sackcloth is sackcloth, you know, carry uncomfortable clothes. Fasting and sackcloth was uh, a practice in the in the ancient world to show genuine repentance. It was a way of you showing to God, look God, I'm really, really sorry. And you know, you made yourself a base. Psalm 51, you won't read it here, but if you want to read um, how David was feeling, actually I'll just read it just because we're in church. Psalm 51, David is expressing how he felt after his remorse. You know, and how often in life, especially young people today, you know, the, the way the world goes, come on, try this. Come on, I can't do any harm. Come on, do this. And then you just see the fruit of it. Like too often I've seen people and that little allure of sin, you know, whether it's pornography or drugs or something, it just draws you in this, and then there's this pleasure for a moment, but the after effects, like, it's just, you know, you can see why God warns us about these things. Um, in Psalm 51, he says, Have mercy upon me. This is how David is now like in the throes of um, guilt, I suppose. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. That's really important. You know, that someone just fesses up. And my sin is always before me. He said, against you, you only. And he pointed, he, he, hadn't, he didn't say he sinned against the guy he murdered or against his wife. He said, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And he, he, he was, he's put his two hands up here. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity by nature or objects of God's wrath. That's a human nature. And in sin, my mother conceived me. That's not to say that by conceiving, she conceived him, but as he was born, if you like, the nature of a human being is, um, is, is of, we, we possess the same nature from when we're born. Behold, you desire truth in the inward part and in the hidden part of your heart. You will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. I won't go on, but you get the drift. This man is looking to have his conscience settled. He's looking for peace with himself and God. He's looking for something in, on the inside that will just take away that biting regret, that biting remorse, that sense of guilt, that sense of shame. Because it can absolutely destroy it. I mean, shame can absolutely wipe you out. I've met the most finest of people Gifted people, able-bodied people, who get so crippled with shame, so they cannot even function. They can't even function as a human being because they are so feeling, so within themselves, so much of a failure. Or I don't know how to put it exactly. You know, but God has made provision for Jesus, hung on the cross naked, to take shame. He took, he, didn't, he took everything again. He became the curse. He knew no sin, became sin. He became whatever this cause of sin. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Another famous story of a national repentance um, was the Ninevites in Jonah chapter 3, especially verses 7 and 8. It says, and he caused it to be proclaimed in public throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat nor drink water. 
But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. This was a national repentance for the city of Nineveh. Jonah, remember the story, the guy who was in the way and he wanted to bring the prophecy. But he eventually brought the prophecy and the king reacted appropriately. I know Brendan was preaching last week about Asa and how the prophet came to him and he reacted inappropriately. But here's a situation where there was a positive outcome. There was a, a national repentance. Because if the king said stop eating, he stopped eating. If he said you put on sackcloth, you put on sackcloth. It was, it was just a different way at the time. Another example is in 2 Kings 20 verses 1 to 6. Isaiah came and prophesied to King Hezekiah. And he told King Hezekiah to get his affairs in order he was going to die. And Hezekiah went into his room and he wept bitter tears. I won't read to it all. But he wept bitter tears inside. And God sent the prophet back to him and said, I saw your tears. I saw your, your weeping in your heart. I give you 15 more years to live. See, God relents. See how God does it. Like, if we mess up, but it's your reaction. It's your, it's your how you respond when you mess up is the difference. Some people get more and more hardened and hardened and hardened and they just lose all sensitivity. But other people, they want to get right with God. They just want to put things right once again in harmony with God. Another uh, <coughs> example of repentance is King Ahab. He, um, Elijah prophesied to him. He's, he was the husband of Jezebel. You often hear the name Jezebel around. So it was when Ahab, Ahab, he just heard the prophecy. The, king, the prophet came, gave him the rebuke, and when Ahab heard those words, he um, he put Nahum, his, his wife inspired him to put a guy called Nahum to death, or Naboat to death, who had a, a wine um, press that the king wanted. Um, when Ahab heard those words, then he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth. So you see his response. He hears the word of God. Tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on his body, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went about mourning. There's an ancient man who did something very wicked, but he had a repentance. But having said that, that's a human repentance. Because up to that point, until Jesus came, this genuine godly sorrow, the repentance that God grants unto faith, that had not been initiated. So if you get me to that, there's like a human element to, to, to repentance, which does, by the way, touch the heart of God, no doubt about it. But there's a repentance that leads to life. And that comes by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings conviction in our lives on um, certain issues and things. Um, Jesus commended a certain person called Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. We read his story inside the Sunday school last week. And here was this tax collector he visited. Jesus entered and passed, sorry, um, Zacchaeus 19, verses 1 to 10, yeah. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. They were swindlers, by the way. Tax collectors used to oppress the people. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He used to see him so, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they complained, saying, these are the Pharisees, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. And the son of man has come to seek to save that which was last. There's a real, real classic example of true repentance, if there ever was one. Because what's this man doing? This man is making restoration for his wrongs. You know, sometimes we have an idea like that we say we rob the bank. The bank manager become, the bank robber becomes a Christian. But does he ever think about restitution? And if it's in your power to give restitution for a wrong that you've committed in your life, then you ought to. 
to demonstrate that you genuinely understand the damage you've done to somebody else. And sometimes they don't, and things go into courts, and judges make awards against people, restitution of years lost, you know, childhood destroyed. We hear a lot about abuse and such and such things today. And judges make awards in favor because a person is destroyed. Because sin is actually deadly serious. Like it. That's why Jesus said that like, if you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, he said it's better than a millstone tied around your neck and you can drop them to the bottom of the ocean. Like it's not a light thing because of the pain that it brings to people. It's like. Then we have in Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 21, we're now full on in the tribulation, which is future. And here's the reaction of those who are experiencing the wrath of God. But the, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. There you go. You know, you think people are good. Think again. This is the high, this is during the plagues. Because that the first seven years. Yeah. You say it's seven years of plagues. Seven years of scrolls, seven months of plagues, and seven weeks of violence. I think that's the way. Seven days of violence, seven. Anyway, whatever. This, this is what the scripture says. That when the judgment of God comes full on, the full wrath of God, never ever experienced on the earth before, this is the reaction of most people. They refuse to repent. Such is the stubborn will of man's heart. We think when the sky is falling, it might change your mind. But they don't. Um, and God actually says when the, God's judgment come into the earth, people learn righteousness. So God's deal, you know, he deals with it both ways, if you like. And then just to finish up this, um, there is an example of I don't know what you described. I got this from Derek Prince yesterday. Um, a repentance that's temporary. Let me put it that way. And in Jeremiah 34, verses 15 to 16, the prophet says to the Jewish people, You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes, speaking the word of God. Then you turned around and profaned my name. Have any of us we come to a true repentance. We came to a faith in God. But later on, have we turned around? And have we profaned his name? And by the way, to profane a person's name is to bring God's name into disrepute. I know someone I was witnessing one time, and I, I was talking to him, and he had a relation with a Christian, and I knew the guy. And the guy had, uh, had fallen into adultery. And he, this guy, when I met this fella, his, that chap's wife, I don't know, he, he was kind of like a nephew, I, I can't explain it exactly, but he was related to him. And he didn't want to hear the gospel. And he said, Do you know, uh, my own consistency, and I said, yeah, well, well, what he was going around talking and preaching, and now look, like what he said. You know, the world just looks at it in, an, in another way, because it's quite merciless. And so basically, it's hogswash, so to speak. But he had profaned the Lord's name. But we can be forgiven. Like we can be forgiven. We can come to God because we have access all the time. As long as we have the attitude, the attitude to come back to Christ when we fail. And uh, Derek Prince said this at the end. He said, repentance is not an emotion. There's remorse. But repentance is not an emotion. He said, it is a decision. And it springs from the human will. Repentance is a decision. And it springs from the human will. Um, and now, given this message this morning to, um, to uh, you know, to say if there's anything that anyone needs to repent of or such, I'm really giving this message as a, as a little bit of depth onto understanding what real repentance is like because we get shallow versions of it in life you know people saying um, okay I'm 
be sorry or you know maybe you know, you'd hear from time even the government wrote a letter acknowledging the hurt and pain that was caused to but not the and yet there's people saying but they're not doing anything about it. They haven't you know recompensed the people in some way. They haven't shown that they really understood the pain that people went through in some of these laundries and homes and different places that people experienced all kinds of abuse and said in different names. So repentance is a much deeper thing than just saying sorry and just um, and just regretting what you've done. It's a much, much deeper thing. It's something where you empathize really with the cause and effect, the effect that what you have caused to somebody else, that you empathize with that and then you go to that person if you can or whatever and you try and make amends in some way. That's what real repentance is. You know, some guy breaks into someone's house and whatever, it's not about saying sorry. He needs to go back. He needs to fix the house. He needs to give back what he's stolen. You know, and in, in it just, it just to be mindful of it because um, this is a gift from God. This gift of repentance that we have is not something experienced by everyone, possibly because they're resisting it. But it's a gift that God has given us. And we should not take it lightly.